Well, hello to all. Thanks for coming. Thanks to Bill and to the SPX for having us here for this invitation. And well, we will, we will be talking about uh, Latin American comics, well, not only Latin American, also Spanish comics, comics in Spanish language, comics in Espanol. And well, let's begin. Uh, into my left, uh, my right, Pablo Guerra from Colombia. He's, uh, he writes about comics. He writes comics. He's a Colombian critic, uh, one of the most specialized critics nowadays in Colombia, in Latin America. Uh, he runs a blog and a website called El Globoscopio in Bogota. That's an artistic collective also uh, composed by authors from Bogota, especially. Then Santiago Garcia uh, from Spain. He, is, uh, he writes about comics, he writes comics. He's the, authors of, uh, the author of several comics uh, with Spanish authors. And he runs a blog, a very specialized blog, with critics and comments and reviews of comics from Spain specifically, and also from all over the world. And then Scott, uh, he is from the United States. He is uh, the publisher of uh, Bronco Inc and he's interested in Latin American comics, specifically in the Argentinian author Hector Oesterheld. So let's begin. Uh, I think Scott will be the first in line, and then Santiago, no, then, then Pablo, yeah. then Santiago, and then at the end we'll be talking uh, about all the map in the region. So thanks again, and let's begin. Thank you for the air. Thank you for the introduction. My, I, my name is Scott O'Brown. I am the, actually the editor uh, for Bronco Inc. Uh, I have a deep ties to the Argentinian comic scene. Uh, I've been friends with many of those folks for years, and, and I'm, I'm making an effort to bring it into the, uh, the United States in the English language. I wanted to talk a bit about Argentina um, history, censorship, and today you can't talk about Argentine, Argentine comics without discussing the history of um, censorship and oppression that many of the well, several of the creators um, found themselves in the midst of. Uh, our, we, well, I'm going to focus on, on three people mainly. Hector Oesterheld, he was a seminal writer. He collaborated with many of the Argentine and Italian artists to, to lay the groundwork for the industry in the 60s. Uh, Horatio Lalia, he was a collaborator of Oesterheld. Who, he built a body of work that is just a massive, massive body of work that spans from the 60s to, to today. And I'm going to show you quite a few samples of it. it he's he's he, he is the bridge that makes, um, that, that connects the modern to the historical. And then finally, I'm going to end with a little talk about Carlos Diaz and Claudio Ramirez. They're, uh, they're a modern writer and artist continuing in the same traditions of uh, Osterheld and Lalia. Um, you know, definitely, there's definitely a, a thread that, that pulls them all together. I wanted to start with uh, Osterheld. Like I said, he was a prolific writer. His influence is the strongest in the 60s and the 70s until his death. His, he's best known for El Atronauta, Mort Cinder, Sergeant Kirk, and his biographies of Evita and Shea, which he did with Alberto Breccia. And he was also on the, convergent, on the ground floor of the convergence of the Italian and Argentine comic scenes. Uh, he's collaborated with, with the Hugo Pratt, uh, Horatio himself, and, and, and Breccia, as mentioned. He really defined the genre um, comics of the time. Uh, he, his work was seen in, you know, in, in Revista Scorpio and several of the other magazines that, that came out. Uh, here's a little sample from El Itronata. It's, a, uh, it's about a time traveler trying to save his, invasion, uh, save his family during an alien invasion. There's a strong focus on community action uh, while, you know, the Itronaut is the hero of the piece, uh, ultimately nothing happens that, that, that the, uh, the entire cast, you know, doesn't make happen. It's, it's, it's a very, it's not so much about the individual success like you see in a lot of American, you know, comics. It's, it's about, you know, how the group works in full. Uh, Mort Cinder is probably one of his more famous pieces. Uh, again, it's another one of the many books he did with Breccia from Italy. Uh, it's a man, about a man who constantly comes back from the dead and various, has various adventures in the, in, in the process, kind of like a gothic Doctor Who 
style character. Uh, what's kind of cool, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about it, but the Mort, Mort Cinder himself is the gentleman that's standing tall there. Uh, his, that's actually based off of Horatio Lalia's uh, own visage. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's where we start seeing these, these traditions come together. Here's the cover of a, a recent Spanish language edition of the Avida biography. Now here is uh, Necrodamus. You know, we, we, we're talking about Lalia. Um, it, it's, it starts, it's where they start to bridge the gap. This ran in the 70s and ran for many, many issues and, and has been collected in France and Italy. Not, hasn't made it to America yet. I'm working on it. Um, he's, a, he's a gothic Doctor Strange style character. Um, it, it had he heavy, heavy critique, and, and you'll see this in a lot of the Argentine comic scene. Uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these books are very critical of the political landscape there. And this is something that actually comes back to haunt Osterheld um, in, the, in the later years. Um, he was disappeared. The, his, his political associations and writings in the middle of the military junta at the time um, really it, it destroyed his family. Uh, his daughters were all pregnant at the time. Um, and they were all, you know, when I say disappeared, it's just they were there one day, they were gone the next. And, and, and that's just a euphemism. You, you, know, you know what really happened. Um, there was some contact with Osterheld before his actual death, um, which was confirmed in 1978. It was, a, it, was a, it was a devastating blow to the comic scene there. Um, he was the thread that, that held it all together. Uh, Horatio. Well, he he's the one that, that that's that's he's honestly he's the one who's keeping it all alive. He was active in during '62 through today. He's still. I mean, we we he is working on. He, the man is so prolific; it's crazy. We we do a project every few weeks. Um, we're talking about something else. We've been reprinting his short stories. Um, he's just an amazing, amazing artist. Um, he was one of Brecky's uh, assistants, and, and, and like I said, he was the model for the Mort Cinder character. Uh, his current series uh, that he's working on is called Krantz, which is appears which appears in Revista Scorpio. I, I, I actually that's the first book that we've done uh, with these people. Um, it's yeah. he did it with Jorge Morhain. Um, he also has another one called Belzaric, a little bit of a political intrigue in hell. Uh, I've worked with him on two graphic novels, Red Ice and They Do Not Die. Um, and his literary adaptations are also uh, floating out there. He's done Lovecraft, Poe, Wells. It's something he's quite proud of. There's a little bit from the Red Ice I mentioned. It's, uh, uh, we're, we're actually running this story right now in, in a free magazine um, called Off Registration. I have some information for that on the end, but it's uh, as you know, as 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 you can see, I mean, you saw his, you know, the previous slides, like Necrodamus, He has a massive eye for detail, but when you put color on it, you know, it just it just breathes even more life into it. Uh, here's a bit about Belzaric, as you can see, a bit of the colors there too. I mean, it's just it's just an awesome piece of work. Here's a, an example from the crypt. And one of his adaptations of Lovecraft. Uh, this is uh, Inspector Bull with with uh, Carlos Albiac. He's uh, you know this is a uh, just a tra traditional Victorian thriller detective story. And here's a bit from Krantz, the book we're currently doing. Um, we we have this at our table right now if you want to check it out. But it, this was banned in the 80s. Um, it, it, there was a mistranslation. The main character's name is Ross Krantz, and as it moved from Spanish to Italian, um, they, they translated it as Rose Cross. And it, 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 was, it was taken as a direct comment on, on uh, the Catholic Church. I don't know if you're familiar with Rosicrucianism, but it was, uh, you know, it was a classic secret society critical of the church. You know, you, uh, if you're a Rosicrucian, you never admit to being a Rosicrucian. If you did, you weren't a real one. Um, it, it was complete illogic, but you know the, pub the, the publisher was under pressure from the church itself, and they canceled it. Uh, they recently relaunched it in Revista Scorpio a few years ago. Um, it's collected by Do Books and Bronco Inc. Uh, they've continued the story; it's going on. I think they've pushed up to a second volume and are actively working on a third. 
Um, like I said, Horatio is still alive today. He's collaborating on a variety of short stories and graphic novels in both the U.S. and Argentine markets. And he is the connective thread. Um, there are, he's not the only one that is, but there's, there are two that are important um, who are doing current work, uh, who, who, I'm, uh, who I am also working with. Um, those are Carlos uh, Diaz and Claudio Ramirez. Uh, Carlos Diaz wrote Viet Zom. It's a graphic novel about zombies in Vietnam with, with Claudio. Um, that's something we're going to be publishing uh, actually in about two months. Uh, he's also working with uh, Marcelo Brasile and Red Sun, and it's a dystopian future uh, story. Alien virus changes human evolution. You know, there's that this this genre thread runs deep, deep in the uh, culture there. Uh, Claudio himself has worked as an assistant for a variety of cartoonists, and in, in 1990 co-created um, El Cazador. Uh, it was involved with Jorge Lucas, Mauro Casaloni and uh, Ariel Olivetti. Uh, you may be familiar with them if you read Batman or Thor. Um, it was published until 1999. It was one of the most popular. It was, uh, think of it as a uh, parody of the, the characters like Lobo and Wolverine. Again, this is also very, very political, and there are some very extremely distasteful panels I did not include. But he, again, this is one of those things where they kind of, the, the, the church has deep influence across, you know, from, from Italy to Argentina, because Ar Argentina's culture is very much a blend of Spanish and Italian traditions. And a lot of people don't like that. <laughs> so it becomes a great target for, uh, for uh, you know, satires like this. Uh, here's a little bit on, on, on Viet Zom, just so you, you see what Claudio is doing these, you know, in these days. You know, it's, it's just this great dynamic style of his I love it um, these all this is a monster it's one that they've both well the, oh Carlos did this one himself and now that I see my notes here um, yeah he, he drew this one himself and um, here's something else that they've collaborated on these will be appearing again in our, our magazine off registration uh, you can get more information on us and, and what we do and, and, and what we're doing to bring more Argentine comics to the US um, at broncoinc.com, and if you uh, want to subscribe to off registration and see some of Lalia's current work, um, you can just soon shoot an email to subscribe at offregistration.com, and you'll be signed up. And it comes out every two months. But you know that's it. I hope that gives you a good overview of you know what's what, what's happened in the past and what's coming up in the future. Uh, it's 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 just a it's it's a deep you know, a, a deep culture of comics in, in Argentina, and I'm, I'm truly honored and privileged to be a part of that. Thank you. Well, thanks, Scott. And it's quite possible that the Argentinian scene for comics is the one of the most solid ones in the Spanish-speaking world. Uh, also the Mexican and also the Spanish one. And there are, well, they're all Latin America. It's composed by probably 30, 40 countries. And there are different traditions and several uh, kinds of styles and authors there. So Paulo, just before uh, Santiago speaks about the Spanish the comics, uh, Paulo will be talking about the other Latin American artists uh, also Argentinian artists, but uh, he will be speaking about Peruvian artists, Colombian artists, Mexican artists, that nowadays they com uh, compose the, the most uh, groundbreaking scene in the, in, the, in the region. So I will be uh, supporting Pablo in the presentation, but he will be leading the show. Yeah, we'll have some type of conversation with Daniel. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it basically, I think uh, South American comics are very diverse, and hopefully you will get a taste of all the different um, specificities of each country and how, uh, if, although they exist and we, you know, have live in a very weird uh, or complex continent or region, we've managed also to create great networks for 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 editor for editors, publishers, for creators, for readers. So, first of all, and not to get to classroom-like, uh, we just wanted to show you a map of the region. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not because we think like Americans don't know about maps, uh, but 
because I think it's important to understand that this is a, a region that uh, you know it's not necessarily easy to to um, to connect. So although we are together, we share a language. Blah 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 blah. Uh, you know, geography shapes the way all this cultural uh, exchange works. Um, basically, I think uh, South American comics are sort of shaped by two big traditions throughout, you know, the 20th century, which are Mexico and Argentina. Uh, if you think about it throughout the, you know, 19th century, 20th century, those were the two. Well, we're not including Brazil in this talk, just as a disclaimer. It's a, it's a complex uh, relation. It's very different. We don't share the language. We're, if, if you want, we're interested in, in, in the relation between uh, Spanish, South American comics and Brazil. We can talk about that in the, in the questions. Uh, but going back to the point I was making, um, Mexico and Argentina are the big, big two economies in the region in the 20th century. Therefore, there is a huge um, publishing environment, like a very vibrant uh, environment for uh, comic books and the type of you know mass media comic books that were produced in the 20th century. So in Mexico, you have um, hu a huge, huge, huge tradition of popular comics um, that were massive. You know, you would have a series that would be published every day. And on Sundays, they would publish two issues, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And we're talking about print runs on, in millions, you know, millions of copies. Uh, and then in Argentina, it's not as big, but it's a little bit more varied. Um, so you have you know, prints of a hand, uh, half a million copies. Um, and as Scott was saying, uh, you know, in the 1950s, when Osterhild, for example, when he started publishing his own publisher, called Oracero, he would publish like basically half a million copies of his comics and, and they were distributed all over the cities. Um, so, so, you know, the streets are a huge part of this, this story. Um, so now we'll talk about what happens by the end of the 20th century, because I, I think that's where it, it starts to get more interesting in terms of self-publishing and alternative ways of making comics. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the different countries that we think are more relevant. Um, starting out in Mexico, I mean, I was telling you they had this huge, huge tradition, but um, I mean, at the same time, I think the the proximity to the United States can be sometimes very confusing for comics creators. So you have a, a couple of generations of Mexican creators who just wanted to publish in the US and were very focused on making superhero comic books. Uh, in spite of that, um, there's a couple of very interesting uh, independent creators and independent uh, magazines. You have Pinches Comics, for example, which is uh, one of the first um, like alternative comics, more contemporary anthologies uh, in Mexico that is actually paid by uh, the district, you know, the city and, uh, and the government, basically. We will see throughout this, this talk that many of the um, cultural, cultural environments that allow comics creator to flourish come or have some sort of involvement of, uh, state, of the state, of money from the state. Uh, which is a very interesting feature, like a characteristic that is very different from how things work here in the U.S., I guess. Um, but uh, aside from Pinches Comics that, you know, would feature people like Hernan Siriani uh, or people like Beth, um, Hernan Siriani is this very interesting creator, uh, very non-PC creator, who's uh, Mexican-Argentinian, right? Yeah, he was born in Argentina, but he lived in Mexico as a child, and then he he's a, like a mix of the two cultures. He's like the he has the ultimate uh, South American, American <laughs> accent. Um, um, you you also have you know by like uh, 2005 2006. Uh, you start finding that they, uh, the creation of different uh, graphic novel publishers uh, so who face 
different sets of, of difficult difficulties. Um, they are coming from uh, an interesting generation, a, a, a really interesting cultural generation of youth in the 90s who were starting to do music and all types of stuff. Some of them do comics, who they are the Cara de Perro group. Um, and, and, and as they get older, the, they start publishing their work on, you know, uh, publishers like Sexto Piso or Resistencia. Uh, there's another one called Caligrama that, that has disappeared now. Um, so you have people like uh, Edgar Clement and Beth, who have been working for many years, who, you know, are very careful readers of uh, comics from all over the world, who, you know, start... Um, really producing work that is that is very interesting on, on many on many levels. You also have people like Ricardo Pelaez who has he works as an illustrator but when he makes his own comics he blends, you know, sort of the, the dynamic um, the, yeah, like the, the dynamic narration of maybe more American comics and the sort of very classic way of approaching uh, drawing. Uh, galleries have also played a, a big role, Vertigo Galleria, for example. Um, the, the, the other part of this story is that Mexico is a still a, an editorial powerhouse, you know, throughout, you know, all types of books. And comics have started to open, you know, different spaces in those big, big, big uh, shows and, and inside, like, that business. It's not... It doesn't necessarily work. I mean, for independent cartoonists, for you know, self-publishers and stuff, uh, it doesn't really make sense to go into sort of the more mainstream, traditional uh, outlets to sell their books. It makes sense to participate in the in, uh, in the editorial market as a whole. Then we have Colombia. In Colombia, we'll, we'll talk a lot about Colombia, I guess, because we're from there. Uh, well, Daniel and I, at least. Um, We'll welcome Santiago to become Colombian any time. Um, <coughs> in Colombia, uh, there's no really a mainstream. You never really have, uh, except for maybe the 1970s, like a big presence of, of, of American comic books or European albums. So there has always been a struggle. In the 1990s, we start to get like a, an interesting movement in Bogotá of independent creators, uh, basically uh, who wanted to publish at this uh, magazine called Acme. Um, when Agni disappears by the end of the 1990s, uh, there's this big, big, like, it, it leaves a big void. And that void started to be filled with um, another type of, 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 of fanzines uh, that are, you know, this uh, self-published um, things that are very really cheap. They're usually, usually free. So in Medellin, we'll have a um, gazette called Robot. Robot. Um, like an Android, it's hard for me to say robot, um, and that that is a, a, a very 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 important publication. It starts out in 2003. It features the work of people like uh, Trucha Frita. Trucha Frita is literally uh, fried right. trout. Um, it's a very special name. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a very special dish. Um, then you have Johnny Bay. You have uh, somebody like uh, Marco Noreña. Marco Noreña, I think he embodies this uh, new spirit that becomes relevant in the Colombian comics that is basically just publish your own stuff. Just, just really get, get it to people. Um, he's a, a very particular guy. He hasn't really finished um, any of his comics, I think, except for the really, really, really short, uh, short like one-page graphic novels which is what he works on. Um, but he has, he, he really like pushed creators into just getting their work out there. Uh, stop thinking about uh, creating a market, creating an industry, and just, you know, generate things. And that is very much the spirit of the Gazette. Um, Marco still is not making a lot of money out of comics or any money out of comics. Uh, some of his uh, contemporaries are, uh, luckily. Um, so Robot generates a, a very interesting movement in Medellin. Um, 
And then in 2006, we have the appearance of Revista Larva, which is edited and directed by Daniel. Uh, and that sort of takes what was happening in Medellin and projects it nationally. So you start, you know, not only having people from one city, but then you have people from different cities with similar sensitivities towards comics collaborating and creating um, this magazine. And it also starts opening up spaces, institutional spaces. Um, again, Larba is a, a comics anthology that is supported in part by com money coming from uh, the state. Uh, from you know the, cost, the cultural uh, ministry, the secretary of culture, uh, and from like local money, local government, government uh, like uh, the mayor of Medellin, the mayor of Armenia, well, different cities. And 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 what happens with that is that you start uh, like calling the attention of sort of the more traditional like uh, cultural uh, institutions in the country. So you have, you know, the, the very few uh, cultural magazines start thinking about comics. They start reading, you know, the comics canon, the graphic novel canon. There is an anecdotic story here because the comics in Colombia until 2012 were considered a oh, yeah. non-cultural uh, art well, like a, something like the, that. there is a there was a law that, that uh, it's a law to empower books like to you know facilitate the, the creation of books the publication of books and comics were out of the of the benefits of the benefits of, the benefits of, the, of, the, of that law so comics have to has to pay uh, more taxes and so the prices were really really high if you import a comic or if you produce a comic so well it was a uh, pretty discrimination uh, but we changed that law in 2012 thanks to the work of larva thanks to the work of different collectives in in different cities and well that's the reason that perhaps we have more publishers nowadays yeah. and different authors trying to make some more stuff in comics yeah for example the history of colombian comics has has never really been done uh, right and has never really had any kind of uh, interest. It, it, it is not a, a, an interest of any, like the National Library or any kind of cultural institution until this moment of, of changing the law. I, I, had, has, I have just recently finished a, a research work on Colombian comics in newspapers uh, in the 20th century. That is the first step in sort of, you know, figuring out what the history of Colombian comics is and seeing it as part of sort of the cultural patrimony of the country, which is a, a very interesting step. Um, let's move on because so we have time to talk about the different countries. Uh, in Peru, there is a, a very, very, very interesting comic scene. Um, they, from Lima, they published uh, one of the main uh, anthologies called Carboncito. It's, a, it's a, an anthology that features, you know, this, this growing number of creators from Spain and South America. That is, it is very interesting. Uh, of course, there's a, a very, a huge uh, fanzine scene there. Um, there's also uh, a library that is also a publisher called Contra Cultura. Uh, and there's a new one coming that is called Pictograma, a new, a new publisher. Uh, they're all independent. In Contra Cultura, you know, you have uh, very interesting creators. It has a more political, um, sometimes it has a more political sort of angle to the comics, a political interest in the comics. So Scott was talking a little bit about Osterheld as a, as a uh, the political Osterheld. He was part of the guerrillero group, um, the Montoneros in the 70s. Uh, that has to do with his disappearance. We can talk about that in the questions or afterwards, whatever. Um, and then, for example, Contra Cultura would, do, would publish Rupai and Barbarie, two documentary comics about, uh, about political violence in Peru in the 1980s, for example. Um, <coughs> in Bolivia, this interaction between institutions and comics is very interesting because uh, through things like spacio, uh, Espacio C más C, like space C plus C, um, they, they, they have started to generate uh, new venues and new spaces, new events for creators, uh, very much from the idea that comics are uh, a big part of education or have a, a potential as an educational tool, but from an alternative perspective. 
I mean, it's not about it, uh, sort of. Um, since you're getting money from the state, since you are, since you are, let's say, um, doing something that seems very, like, formal. Uh, you don't have to uh, do comics that are formal. You don't have to do comics that are imposed uh, or that you know are trying to be educational. You can do whatever you want, but that has a value in in, in getting people into reading, into books, into new types of cultures. Um, they have a great festival called uh, Viñetas con Altura that had you know has had a lot of a long list of international guests. Um, and you have people like Marco Toxico uh, and a publisher called um, La Ñaña, right? La, La Ñatita. La Ñatita, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Chile, uh, I think Chile is one of the, except from Argentina maybe, that's, that's where uh, most like graphic novels are being published every year. There's an event called Viñetas del Fin del Mundo. Viñetas is the word for panels, just in case you start seeing viñetas all over the place. Um, don't get confused about that. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, there's a, an art gallery that has played a key role in the development of comics in Chile. It's called Plop. Um, they feature, you know, artists from all over the world, uh, artists from Latin America, and they have really pushed uh, the boundaries between sort of, you know, traditional art and comics, and that, that has also been uh, played a key role all over the, the region. So you have not only, I mean, uh, it used to be the case that comics creators were people who grew up reading, uh, you know, Superman, and they wanted to work on comic books. But part of what's interesting is that uh, the, the, the 21st century generation um, are, 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 are far more diverse. We have much more women doing comics, for example, uh, with Daniel, we, we put together, well, Daniel mostly, and I help him sometimes, we put together the Festival Entre Viñetas in Colombia. And for example, last year we had, uh, was it like mostly female creators, right? There was, and it was not like an intention. We, we didn't say, oh, we want to do the happens. female creator festival. It just happened. So it really is, uh, it's starting to get far more diverse. So comics creators, um, they are coming from different like uh, interests. So you have a lot of artists, you have a, a lot of graphic designers, you have a lot of different people wanting to do comics for very different reasons. You want to say something? Okay. <laughs> okay. So now, and uh, last Argentina, why we put them together? Because there's a, a yeah, lot of really close countries, and <laughs> Argentina is very close to Uruguay. Uruguay is a really small country, so they have like a very strong relationships. They are like uh, a brotherhood. Yeah, I think if, if XPX keeps on growing, it would, uh, you know, have more attendees than uh, inhabitants in Uruguay, maybe. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, there's a lot of, of exchange between uh, Uruguayan and Argentinian uh, publishers. And usually Uruguayan creators move to Argentina and work from Buenos Aires. Um, the, the history of, of alternative or, you know, self-published comics in Argentina is very interesting. Uh, just to give you a, a short summary, uh, you know, you have, you know that Argentina, Argentina at the beginning of the 21st century ha had this huge economic collapse that, uh, of course, affected comics greatly. And what happened is that you have uh, a set of creators who were used to work as professionals or, or you know, up-and-coming creators who really didn't have nowhere to publish, nowhere to do their work. And they uh, started making fanzines. And those fanzines were di distributed on the streets in, like, uh, newspaper stands. Uh, so you have something like Lapi, uh, Lapis Japonés, which is a, a big, big, big fanzine anthology, very complex book, beautiful book that feature people like Laguer and a lot of amazing Argentinian creators that uh, generated uh, this, uh, this new generation of self-publishers. Um, and that has really been the, the identity of, of Argent the Argentinian scene. Um, 
And so now there's, uh, I mean, a lot of things have happened too. You know, the economy is getting a little bit better. So now you have different venues. A lot of those uh, people who were doing the fanzines now have opened, you know, they're more traditional publishers. So you have a very interesting scene with people like Loco Rabia, La Flor, Editorial Común, Llanto uh, de Mudo, for example. Um, that, and, 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 and the other part that is interesting is that in a city like Buenos Aires, there's a lot of libraries, a lot of bookstores everywhere, all over the city. So in those bookstores, you find those graphic novels and those comic books. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I've been speaking a lot. Just now, just anthology. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the anthologies. Uh, in Argentina, there's a very traditional anthology that is called Fierro. Fierro has two, like, two faces. There's, uh, uh, the first Fierro started out in the 1980s, and it was uh, sort of the South American response to sort of the Asquivre, the Metal Hurland, all that tradition in Europe. You know the, the science fiction fantasy tradition in Europe, so you have you know they featured amazing creators, uh, great 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 writers who were working for Europe but also wanted to publish their work or they wanted to break into the European market, um, and it's of course an anthology that will reflect the political changes that were happening in Argentina uh, in 1983. You know the like the dictatorship stops. Um, so, you know, they start again with democracy and Fierro would, you know, in many ways uh, vi reflect the feelings of, of that transition. Uh, I talked about the, 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 the Peruvian anthology called Carboncito, um, which is, you know, great. It's a great way to sort of set the map, to figure out what, what type of, it, uh, of exchanges are happening in the region. And then there's Larba from Colombia, uh, directed by, by Daniel, that uh, really started out as a, as a fanzine, as a, as a university fanzine, actually, and um, started to grow and grow and open new spaces, and, and has really focused on, on, uh, on, on playing a key role in, 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 in showing that comics can be really complex, and that it's not about just showing one local scene or one particular type of scene, but it's really an international phenomenon. It's an international dialogue. And, um, and yeah, thank you. That's, That's all, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the compliments about Larba, Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> no. Ah, yes, we are in, at the M12 stand with all of these publications, if you want to give us some money yeah. uh, to go back to Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, then Santiago Garcia will be talking about Spanish comics now. He will be introducing us to the landscape of Spanish authors. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I didn't bring a map. I, uh, because Spain is so small. I hope that <laughs> everybody is clear that Spain is in Europe. Uh, that's the reason that Spain didn't appear in the map that Pablo showed before. <laughs> and uh, well, we actually are a country of uh, around 40 million people, and uh, so like like the size of uh, California or Texas or something like that. It's interesting to have some perspective on uh, what kind of. Uh, size have our industry and our print runs and everything. Um, I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of what's happening with comics and now, right now in Spain, which is a lot uh, actually, and I'm going to try to go briefly uh, through some history so that you know where we come from and how we are uh, the way we are now. So uh, the, actually, um, Spain has a rich and long history of, uh, of comics that is very similar to the history of every Western European country. Uh, we started mostly in the 19th century with um, uh, satire and uh, political caricature magazines in that way. This is, these samples are very similar to what you can see if you study French or Italian or British comics of the time. And by the 20th century, we already have this industry of comics focused on uh, 
children and teenagers mainly. Uh, this is the first number of Tebeo, which was so popular that actually gave the name to the medium in our country. So we call Tebeos to the comics there, mm -hmm. e even uh, still now. So in the f uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, we had this um, newsstand popular industry, uh, which has um, comic books, staple, very cheap comic books. Uh, with adventure comics for boys, romantic comics for girls, and especially uh, lots of uh, humor and satirical comics for everybody, because actually uh, adults uh, used to, to read uh, these uh, humor comics as well. Uh, we're talking of uh, print runs of uh, hundreds of thousands every week. Uh, this, was, this was huge. Uh, of course, we didn't have uh, television, but uh, during that time, especially the 50s and 60s, you could say that comics were everywhere in the, in the country. So when democracy came to Spain in the uh, 70s, uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s, what happened was that um, we have like this explosion of uh, comics as a self-expression of um, underground comics and mainly of adult comics that we hadn't had uh, before. Uh, this is a very political uh, comic by Max the, from, that, from that time, for example. And um, after that, uh, what happened was that at the end of the century, the traditional publishing industry, uh, which has lasted mostly till the 80s, has almost been erased, uh, has disappeared completely. And uh, this explosion of new adult comics that we have during the first years of the democracy uh, have died out as well. So what we have were uh, what was being published in Spain during that time was mostly translations from American, French, and Japanese comics. And we almost didn't have like um, our own production uh, out there. So in that time, what the Spanish authors that were working in the country could do was mostly like uh, mini comics, fan scenes, uh, things uh, that were very cheap and not too ambitious. Uh, if you wanted to be a professional and actually make a living doing comics in Spain in that time, you have the talent to do that, you couldn't work in the country anymore. So you have to sell your work to um, international publishers. That's what happened since uh, especially late 90s and, and early uh, 21st century. And what happened was that uh, people like um, Diaz Canales and Guarnido uh, did Black Shark for Dargo in France, and uh, people like David Zaha uh, made um, Iron Fist for Marvel and a lot of other American comic books. Actually, there's now in Spain like, I don't know, um, probably almost 100 artists working for the French and the American industry. But they only get published in Spain when they get translated by the Spanish uh, publishers that have the, the license to, to those comics. So in that time, uh, let's say uh, 2000, 2002, something like that, I actually thought that um, the history of um, Spanish comics was done and over, that we wouldn't have um, our own comics um, in the future, and that we will have to just limit ourselves to work for international markets. But then something happened. Mm, uh, there was a few new publishers that appeared in that time. And they started to publish um, international graphic novels in Spain, and a little bit more each year. And Blankets was especially important in this story, Blankets by Craig, Craig Thompson, because um, the publisher that, uh, that did uh, Blankets in Spain was uh, thinking of publishing it in three different volumes, because they thought that it was a book too big, too expensive, that was, was something unheard of in our market. 
who was going to buy a book of this um, characteristic, a book so ambitious. But at the, last, at the last time, at the last minute, they decided that they were going to pull the trigger and go ahead. And they did just one volume of, of uh, blankets that was um, stunningly expensive for that time, it was like 35 euros, which was something that nobody was spending on commies at that time, and was a huge success. After the last uh, moment, everybody was uh, set on publishing graphic novel in Spain, and the market started to uh, change a lot. Uh, graphic novels started to appear in general bookstores outside of the specialized bookstores that, were, that are very similar to the ones that you have in the United States. And uh, graphic novels started to get reviews on cultural supplements, on newspapers and general publications, and it started to gather certain prestige and uh, recognition. But uh, there was a um, piece missing, and it was, uh, uh, was it possible to have, uh, to reproduce this kind of success with uh, a Spanish graphic novel done by a, a Spanish author? So what happened that uh, changed everything was in 2007. That was the, the year that was the, the real turning point for, for Spanish comics. Then Arrugas by, by Paco Roca appeared. Um, this is a graphic novel about, um, well, about Alzheimer, about the, the uh, illness, and about uh, old people losing their memories and losing uh, their health. And surprisingly, it was a huge, huge hit. It's actually uh, one of the bestsellers uh, of, of the century in Spain. It's, uh, I think. It's uh, now in the 11th edition, and it's around 75,000 copies. So that if you project that into the population of the United States, it will be probably more than a half a million copies. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, no, so we, we don't have cell phones. Uh, by, by, Paco, by Paco Roca and other works that Paco has done later have, has, uh, have been really huge. Uh, they did an uh, animation movie that actually has uh, been in the United States uh, this, uh, this year. Uh, Arrugas has been translated into uh, almost every language that you can imagine, uh, even Japanese. Uh, Amazingly, it hasn't been published in the U.S. It's one of the uh, uh, the only places where you can find uh, Arugas. That same 2007 uh, year was the year that saw the publication of uh, Maria Yo, which was uh, another work that uh, was about the relationship between the cartoonist and her daughter, who is autistic, and. It was another another uh, huge success that has um, a movie made about that. It was a documentary movie. This is uh, Maria y yo. Um, so after we was a Maria y yo, uh, that was a really a turnover for Spanish comics. Everybody really believed that this was the way and that we, ha we have a new future that was in the in the graphic novel and that we have a new public, a new audience there waiting for our our comics and actually um, society was like uh, very uh, receptive to this uh, new development uh, 2007 was the year that the government established an hour for a national hour for the best uh, comic of the year which was a big deal because this this gave us a lot of um, uh, space on media and, and a lot of, uh, again, cultural uh, presence. And the first one who won the, the award was Max, and the second one the next year was uh, exactly Arrugas by Paco Roca. And uh, after that, uh, this late, uh, this last uh, seven years has been, uh, has seen a lot of uh, graphic novels published in Spain by uh, Spanish creators that don't want to work for uh, foreign markets where they have to follow um, other tastes and, and 
other ideas and it's, uh, it has been mostly about personal expression and doing your work for Spain and then selling the rights to other countries who are interested in those. So um, since we are mm, mostly out of time, I'm going to just um, let you see some samples of a few of the many cartoonists, most of them very young, that are right now doing comics in, in Spain in this uh, way. For example, this is Platanit, who is, is, this is a story about um, how hard it is to be an artist and a mother at the same time, and how to be happy anyway. Um, Alvaro Ortiz, as you can see, most of them have a very, um, David Sanchez, very personal style. Uh, they don't follow rules or classic genre expectations. Uh, this is Mireya Perez. Michel Mood, who is actually, uh, he actually started in the 80s. It's, there's a few artists right now that started at the 80s that are still active, like Michel Mood or Max, whose uh, la last uh, work has just been published by Fantagraphics, that you can, you can find it um, here in the, in the SPX. Uh, Sergi Pujol. Uh, many of these uh, artists are looking at what's happening outside, uh, you know, in, in all the world, and they have a very different influences. Paco Alcázar, who you need to know a lot of Spanish to understand, but it's actually very funny. It's, uh, he's been published in the U.S. in the Blab Anthology uh, a few years ago. Uh, Jose Domingo, uh, who has a huge book. Uh, two years ago, uh, that has been translated. Uh, well, translated, translated is not the word because it's a wordless uh, book, but has been published by No Brow in uh, in uh, UK. Uh, this is uh, by me and David Rubin, and this is a uh, this is an adaptation to comic of uh, the poem Beowulf that is going to be published here in the US next year. Many of these artists you can find in an anthology that we did uh, last year that uh, was called Panorama that I love to see published here in the US because I think it's a perfect introduction to this movement uh, to, for the American uh, readers. And uh, outside of the graphic novel, very briefly, we have comics uh, as well uh, online, web comics. Uh, there's a Many of them that are very interesting, like Joan Cornellà, who is probably very popular all over the world. And we have like uh, very small publishers that are trying to do things different, like these outsider comics who are doing like boxes with mini comics inside, or Caramba, who did a comic book which was like a long, long roll of paper with a lot of artists that are here in the photo. You can see them uh, trying to hold the the comic. And many of these uh, ideas of you interested in knowing a little bit more on the history of the graphic novel and what happened and how do we did we get to this uh, point and what happened in Spain, you can maybe find in a book that I wrote a few years ago and that University Press of Mississippi is going to publish here in the States uh, next year, which is called on, on the Graphic Novel. This is a provisional cover, and uh, that has been it. Thank you. Thanks to Santiago. Uh, sadly, we are getting short of time, uh, so I only have one question, and then I will be giving you the word. Uh, well, there is a difficult relationship between the, uh, the American publishers and the translations uh, and the other languages. But in the, in the recent years, we have seen that there is an interest in French works, uh, German works, German-speaking works, and but not in the Spanish, not uh, with strongest uh, intentions. Why do you think that's happening? Why it's not there, the, that uh, interest in the in the Spanish works of comics? Why? Why? And I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite... Why there's no interest uh, by American publishers? Uh, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. I think it's amazing. I think they're, they're amazing as a whole. I mean, you have this, this wide variety. It's almost like an alternate universe, you know? It's like this, this weird 
you know, it's this, this another way of looking at it. And, and uh, you know, everyone always talks about the French comics, you know, the band knees and, and everyone gets excited about manga, but, but there's something really unique here. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm more than happy for every other publisher to completely overlook them because, <laughs> because I, I stand behind this, the, the, the bringing this work to the U.S. as much as possible. Well, I mean, regarding South American like uh, alternative creators, is, is this that I think there's a, um, I mean, for example, the stuff that you're interested in. Yes. Uh, I think it's uh, like you would have artists who were not necessarily working for the Argentinian market, and, and after a certain point, they're working for the UK, for example. Well, yeah. Well, the Coratio does a lot for the Italian market. You right. know, it's a, yeah. It's, it's so it's very interesting to see how those two worlds or two traditions, two sensibilities, like interact with each other through you know genre. Right. So you would have you know they would have these interesting dialogues between like creators, readers, and artists just writing like fantasy, like crazy fantasy yeah. stories. And then, I don't know, I think it's it's about like, uh, I mean, regarding like this other type of creators that, that I, I try to talk about, to talk about in South America, I, I think there's a lot of shared sensibilities um, with, you know, the similar types of scenes in, in Europe and the United States. But it's it's a tough bet too, right? In terms of, of money, in terms of sales, I think we've had creators like Liniers, for example, in Argentina, or Paul Paola in Colombia, who have managed to uh, you know produce things that sell very well. But the question is, I mean, I, there's not even like a decent translated version of Mafalda, which is the comic strip character that is very traditional throughout the continent and cannot be found in the U.S. So, I don't know, I think it's something that must be done, but then you have to let people know the whole story and, and maybe find if there's interest in, in this type of thing. Uh, maybe from the side of the political type of comics, like uh, I was telling you about Barbario by Jesus Cosio, I've done stuff about like the Colombian conflict, uh, somebody like Camilo Aguirre who we've, we've tried to, you know, do stories about violence and about uh, the Colombian history and from the side of memory that hopefully will, I don't know, we'll find readers all over the world. That's, that's why we do it. But I, I don't know. I think they are interested. It's just that they, they don't know it yet. <laughs> yeah. They are just discovering. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think. Well, how much time do we have? Sorry. Okay. Sorry. We would love to talk more about uh, Spanish comics uh, at the whole <laughs> outside yeah. the auditorium. But thank you for your interest. Thanks for the, your interest. Thanks to the, to Bill for this invitation to the SPX. And well, thanks. Thank you.